Good morning. One of the things that we normally announce is where the restrooms are. I hope you've got that covered yourself. Um, I had a drawing already this morning to see who got a $100 gift card, and I was able to draw my own name, so I appreciate that very much. Inspecting roof covers. Uh, we're going to talk about that according to the Trek standards of practice. And we're going to cover the reporting requirements, a little bit about installation, physical inspection of the roof cover itself, and I'll point out some references. Um, one of the most difficult things for me to do this sort of presentation is it's without the feedback from the audience, the seeing your eyes and knowing what you're looking at and when you're confused or not. So I'm just going to rely on the fact that you can post questions to the chat room and we'll pause periodically to see who might have some input. A very difficult part of this presentation is bringing it down from what's normally an eight hour presentation to a hundred minutes. Uh, so there are a lot of things that we won't talk about that I might uh, otherwise, if you have a question about it, bring it up and we'll see what we can do to answer those questions. So what's required to be reporting? reported. One of the things is roof covering, the type of roof covering. Well, there are so many things that we could describe that I just wanted to narrow it down and let's just go straight to the IRC. Asphalt shingles, clay and concrete, metal, mineral roll, slate, slate type, wood, wood shake, metal panels. Um, we see so very few of, uh, of anything but asphalt that we're just going to limit what we talk about to asphalt shingles that, that way we can keep it down to the hundred minutes we're targeting. Now there are some derivatives of these for example example uh, metal panels you know there are many different kinds and, and styles wood shake wood shingles um, clay and concrete you get into all the patterns and all of those variations are why we're going to limit it to just asphalt. Viewed from, uh, we're required to report our vantage point. Where did we inspect the roof from? Well, it says in the standards that we shall inspect it from the surface of the roof, unless in your reasonable judgment, you can't safely reach it or stay on it, or you're going to damage it. Well, that means the first thing we have to do is find an inspector with reasonable judgment. Sometimes that's a little tough. But what about you can't safely reach the roof? You don't have to get on the roof if you can't reach it without specialized equipment. So immediately we have to uh, deal with what is specialized equipment. Um, ladders capable of reaching surfaces over one story above the ground. Many, many houses have um, at least a part of the house that comes down to a one story grade or one story level. But every now and then you reach or you find those that you just can't get on unless you do something pretty foolish, I guess. Um, in this particular case, I could not reach this and you'll notice the stairway and there is a landing and then there is a change of direction and the stairway goes up again. But there was absolutely no point on that stair where I could get a ladder safely parallel to that, uh, to that eave. Uh, when I started as a home inspector, I thought, you know what, I'm going to do what others don't. And several times I learned why others don't. In one particular case, the ladder slipped and I was left holding on to the trim and trying to use my feet to pull that ladder back to where I could come down. And that sort of changed my mind. There were times that I couldn't get on a roof with the ladder that I normally carried. So I just changed my, um, my method to recognize safety more than I ever did before. So that's reaching the roof, but what about can't stay on the roof? It's too, sleep, uh, too steep, roof is too wet, or we have inclement weather that is thunder and lightning. Uh, remember that uh, you might hear thunder in the distance, 
and you might hear lightning in the distance, but there's nothing to stop that from moving faster than the rain moves. Uh, too steep, you can just slide off. Um, too wet, same thing. What I find is that I go through shoes very fast. I might change shoes three times a year because those roofs wear off the tread and the less tread you have, um, the more difficult it is going to be to stay on that roof. And then what about the roofs that can be damaged? Obviously clay and concrete tiles are going to be uh, breakable. Um, let's not spend much more time on that. I think we all know that those tile break and we shouldn't get on them. Even though you have to walk on them to uh, install them, we as inspectors would be held accountable, I think, if we did break the tiles. So just stay off of it. Asphalt shingles. Uh, the biggest thing that I learned is damage to those shingles can occur during high temperature. And unfortunately, that's something I had to learn by experience. It was uh, very hot. I stepped on the roof. I thought the slope wasn't uh, too bad. I thought I could do it safely. And when I got down, I saw that uh, my activity had uh, worn some of the aggregate off. So I did the only thing uh, I think that could be done in a circumstance like that is I hid the ladder and ran. Uh, as long as nobody saw me, it didn't happen, right? Uh, unfortunately, I was the only one doing the inspection that day. It was pretty obvious I did it. So if, if it's too hot, don't go on there. Limitations to, uh, to this. If you can't go on the roof or if you choose not to go on the roof, what things can stop it or stop observation? If you use something like the binoculars or a high resolution um, multi-power camera, uh, you can see that sometimes the angle of view, because the trees and property lines and other houses will keep you from getting far enough back to be able to safely uh, or, or to be able to effectively view that roof. Now, you see the picture I took here of using binoculars to show visibility. That's something that I do every time I'm not able to go on the roof or the ladder. And, and don't forget that if you can't go on the roof, you're not excused from using the ladder to view it from the eave. Um, you may not have to actually walk on the roof, but even if you don't walk on the roof, if you can reach it with a one-story ladder, you need to put the ladder against there. And something else you should do, since we're talking about a photograph here, is put your hand, um, put something there that your photograph shows that you actually reached that roof line. Uh, one time when I had to deal with it from a, a legal aspect, somebody said to me, can you prove that was you looking at it? And my watch and the pen I used to uh, uh, point out what I was looking at was the same watch and pen that I had on in the photograph. So do something to prove you reached that roof level. So what about what you can miss here? Well, obviously that tree's in the way. I can't get up there because it's two stories all the way around the house. Um, if I'm going to explain to my client that I didn't get on the roof, might want to talk about what can't be seen because you're going to have cases like this. You have the high side of that chimney and there's absolutely no way you would be able to see that from the ground with binoculars from the roof, uh, Eve on a ladder. Uh, I know that there's some of us out there that are using drones. We won't get into that at all. It's uh, an expensive, specialized tool. My experience with that is when I have seen somebody using a drone, uh, it takes quite a bit of extra time to uh, do that. And in fact, I saw more playing around with the, the drone and showing how impressive it was to the client than actually inspecting the roof. So. You may choose to use that, but ladder, binoculars, ground level, just uh, be sure you talk to the client about what might be missed, including uh, you see there at the, the ridge, 
you might have been able to, to see this with your binoculars, but you'd have only been able to see this area and you'd have to uh, intuitively know that there were some shingles missing. And in this particular case, surprisingly enough, there was no evidence of moisture damage uh, beneath that. And I think that's just because it, it ran down so well, uh, so quickly, that it didn't have time to saturate that decking there. This one is the chimney cap. It's the mortar cap on a chimney. And that cap was over some plywood. Now I have a problem with the plywood itself being used there. Uh, but that's what it was. Couldn't see that from the ground because the best angle you had was up and it just went right across there. Went right across and you weren't able to see the lift or the gap. And then over here, it's pretty clear that uh, somebody cut a hole perhaps for a, uh, a vent, a roof jack of some sort, and then they never bothered going back and putting that in. Um, luckily, I was able to see that there was something wrong with that shingle before I stepped on it. That would have been a bad thing, but there's um, nothing stopping wind from lifting, lifting that up. We'll talk about adhesion on a low wall, but you can see it'd be very easy for wind to blow that up, water to go down, and that shingle would set back down and you might never be able to tell. This is one of my favorite pictures. Now there's a, a couple of problems with it. Have you ever um, said to yourself, well, I don't know that I need to go up on that roof. I think I can see well enough. The slope's good. I can see most of the flashing. And sometimes you take that extra step, not an extra step, but you are diligent and do what you're supposed to. And you get up there and you find something quite amazing. Uh, obviously there was water damage uh, to the ceiling below. And obviously that's around the fireplace, but there's plenty of room for water to get in there and migrate to the places it should not have been. Um, I know we're not doing poles, but this is what I would typically ask here. Do you walk on roofs or you uh, only walk on roofs when they're safe and appropriate? Um, I'll just ask for a show of hands. I see you there in the back, so we'll just uh, we'll note that there are some of us who never walk on roofs. If that's the case, you're allowed to depart. The standard of practice allows you to depart as long as you notify the client at the earliest practical opportunity. Well, I have pulled up to some houses and I see that it's two story and there's no way my ladder's going to, to reach that. Uh, and even if it did, if it was two story and I had a 28 foot ladder, I don't know that I'd be willing to do that. That's a pretty, pretty significant fall. So when I step out of the house and I see uh, my truck and I see that, I go ahead and say to the client, it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to get on that roof. I've never had anybody say to me, okay, the inspection's over, you leave. Uh, but we just talk to them about the fact there might be some things we can't see. Um, and if we get around to the back side and we see there's a lower slope, then I don't have a problem. I uh, use the ladder at, at that point. Be sure that you put in the report, because you're required in the report, why you didn't go on the roof. Your chicken, perfectly good. Uh, it's too high. You couldn't reach it with one uh, story ladder. Too steep, too wet, too hot. Uh, any of those reasons, uh, inappropriate material up there, and you're just not willing to risk the damage. But don't forget that if you routinely depart, that means the first time you talk to the client on the telephone trying to set the job up, you're going to need to tell them that you're not going on that roof. Uh, and also, don't forget that not only do you state the reason you don't go up there, you might some, include some photographs to, and this is not necessarily a photograph to provide to the client, but it would certainly be a photograph to keep in your record to show that this wasn't just a cavalier uh, decision on your part not to go on that roof. There are really obstacles to keep you from going on that roof. And then you talk to them about what might be missed. That's not required in the uh, standards of practice, 
but I think it's just as important um, to tell the client what you see as to tell them what you can't see. You saw the photographs we had earlier. Uh, you could not have seen any of those from the ground. Uh, the one that showed the missing chimney cap, about all you could see there was that the trim was not finished. So obviously there was a problem there, but I would like my client to know there's some places I couldn't get to and some things I couldn't see. Uh, it, it goes back to that same thing. Are you going to recommend that they have further evaluation by a roofing contractor that might have access to those ladders or a roofing contractor that's willing to go on the roof if you weren't willing to go on the roof. Um, I think if you don't tell them what you miss, could miss, you can't see, um, you'll be culpable in a bad decision that the buyer might make or your client might make. Uh, to not have further evaluation. And then if they find after they move in, there's a problem and their complaint is you should have told me. So be sure you tell them why you didn't go up there and what you might've missed. And then perhaps a recommendation for, for something else. So who decides whether it is safe or unsafe to inspect from the roof surface? Well, frankly, it's uh, there we go. It's going to be that guy. Um, that's me. I was on that roof, and when I found out later that the client had taken a photograph of it, I just asked him to send that to me. And from the ground, that looks a lot scarier than it did from the eave top of the ladder when I was holding on to the. Uh, Eve of the dormer there and got on the roof. It's your decision to make. Just be, just be careful about it. And remember the Shania Twain song, Don't Be Stupid. Uh, I think we've all seen a lot of these kind of photographs on, uh, on the internet. And some are much more dangerous than this. And I'll confess that I have gone up on a roof and pulled a ladder up and gone up on the other roof in order to see something that was just extreme or something I was extremely concerned about. Uh, but I wouldn't do either one of these things. First, they only use zip ties over here on this ladder. They should have used duct tape as well. Um, other than that, it's just completely unsafe. And one of the things that bothers me quite a bit when I'll see in new construction the vendor installing the, um, well, well, doing the caulking, actually putting the ladder against the window glazing. These windows can slip. Um, I'm sorry, the ladders can slip. Um, my cousin's husband was killed because the ladder slipped out from under him. Uh, it broke his neck and my brother-in-law broke his ankle and had to go off on disability just because the ladder slipped. And remember that ladder slips back out, it goes under the eave, it can go down, it can hit windows, it, it can just do a lot of damage to you. So please don't be stupid. If you're not going to go on the roof, use the ladder safely. If you go on the roof, use the ladder safely. Uh, OSHA requirements are that that ladder extend above the eave. Um, I think three feet. The transition from that ladder to the roof and the transition from the roof to the ladder are probably the most dangerous aspects of, um, of, of inspecting the roof. That's when it slips. That's when it slipped for me. We're required to report evidence of water penetration. Well, we can see that in the decking the ceiling, we can see some in the walls. Usually it's going to be um, the ceiling before we see it actually running down the walls. We might see it in windows and floors. And seeing it on floors might be unusual. It'd have to come all the way down the wall and run under uh, the floor covering or just on top of the floor covering. But we're gonna see that uh, on floors occasionally. 
More often than not, you're going to see latent evidence of a leak. So we see the, the stain here. We see a little bit of cracking. And at this point, unless you go up there with your finger, or moisture meter, thermal camera, you're going to see a stain and you're not going to quite know whether it's wet or not. If you see a stain, you better do everything you can to determine if it's wet. Now, at this point, we don't know where that comes from. Uh, it could be from a water pipe. It can be from a roof leak. It can be from a water heater. It can be from condensate, from an air conditioner. It could be uh, insulation missing from a refrigerant line causing condensation. You don't have any idea what caused it at this point or how long it's been there. So if you see a stain like this, you need to take some extra steps, talk about, uh, do your best to see if it's wet. And how long is it gonna to take to dry? We have a, a summer when you have 100 degrees, 110 degrees in the attic. Uh, we have it rain two weeks ago. It could be an active leak that this might not be too bad. Now, this is big enough that you can suspect it's an ongoing problem. So let's follow up on that a little. Well, in this particular case, I went into the attic, climbed over some AC duct, a duct walk across some joists, and I got over here and I saw that there was some major damage to this insulation and to the drywall. Now you'll notice that the damage that we see here or the stain we see here is not as extensive as the damage we see here. It just takes time before that all works its way through. So what caused that? We take another step and we look above, above us here. This is a simple hole um, in the roof decking. So that small hole caused this damage that eventually caused this. Well, interestingly enough, this is my house. Um, it took 13 years for that to happen. And what was the source? A nail, a nail hole. Uh, you'll see this silver piece here is just a, a piece of roof flashing, a flat piece of roof flashing that is stuck and slid up under those shingles so that you could um, more easily see the hole. And the source of that hole appeared to be from a, a tow board that the installer had laid horizontally uh, uh, along the roofing, nailed it in place, and removed the tow board after the roof was installed and caulked every nail hole but that one. So it took 13 years for that one small leak to turn into all the damage that you saw below. Now, there is no such thing as a minor leak. And that's, that's proof right there. That small hole is not a minor leak. That small hole is a leak that simply took time before it uh, became obvious. Well, sometimes you don't have to hunt that hard. Uh, it's pretty obvious. You could have seen this from the ground with that one story ladder should you have chosen not to go on the roof, but you could not have seen this with binoculars from the ground. Um, now, interestingly, this was a case where I noted the damage, referred the client to a, a roofer for uh, an estimate of repairs. And about three weeks later, he called me and said the roofer um, came out and said there was damaged decking uh, that I had missed. And I said, did you actually read the report? Uh, no, he said that he saw where it said to refer it to a roofer, and that's all he bothered doing. Um, you need to remember that clients don't read all our reports, or they don't read them carefully. Sometimes they glance through, sometimes they just look at the photographs. So the photographs you have documenting the, the condition, documenting your vantage point, documenting what you might not be able to see, and documenting your recommendation for further evaluation or evaluation and repair is critical for you staying out of a courthouse. Well, 
that's obvious, but you get into attic spaces. Uh, the one on the left seems to be out of focus. I think that was, I must've been drinking. Um, but you can still see that it was uh, deteriorated. And you see the upper right hand quarter, how badly it's deteriorated. Not only has it damaged the decking, but it's begun to damage the, the rafter there. This was a tall enough um, attic space that I could get over to some of those areas and take a, a look at it. A lot of times you only inspect from service decking from that passageway and it simply doesn't allow you to get back into those areas. So I would caution you to um, perhaps offer up a disclaimer that says, here is where I looked at the attic from. We're required to do that. I inspected the attic from the top of the uh, stairway, from the scuttle opening, or from the service passage and service decking. And um, you make sure that you don't just casually look, you get that high powered flashlight in, light and you look down into those eaves because it's down in those eaves that you're likely to see the biggest problem. You see over here in the out of focus one, how the decking has sagged just a little bit. You've got some mineral deposits there and all the water has run downhill. Well, it's gonna run downhill and most of the saturation will be at this point here. You're required to report evidence of previous repairs to the roof covering, the flashing details, skylights, and other roof penetrations. There's no distinction made between the type of repair, the quality of repair, or the extent of repairs. You just at this point report repairs. We'll talk in a second about the quality of repair, but all that you're doing here is saying this roof has had repairs and that might explain some of what you see in the, uh, the attic or what you see in the, um, the ceiling covers. There are two things that I've heard from various inspectors. One is that they go on the roof first to see where repairs have been made. So they're able to look closer at the ceiling cover to see if there's damage. And the other is that they look inside, especially at the ceilings first, so they'll know where to look uh, in the attic for leaks or on the roof for leaks. I personally go on the roof first, uh, but I have also found that there have been times I've had to go back on the roof but my personal approach is go on the roof first, look for those areas that I suspect might leak, and then I'm able to track down in the attic or on the ceilings, whether that's uh, in fact come through. I'm also able to explain because the, the client will not go on the roof with me. I'm able to go inside and say, I see a stain here, and that corresponds with a location of repair to the roof. Um, it's not uh, wet right now, therefore the uh, repair may have been adequate. Um, first of this week, I didn't bother updating this, but the first of this week, following all that heavy rain, I was able to say, well, there's evidence of repair. I got up there and said, right now it's dry. But the client called me the next morning and said, and this was their house, this was a, a seller, uh, was a said, okay, it's leaking right now. They had gone up into the attic to the place I had pointed out and taken a photograph of. Uh, they texted me a photograph and sure enough, uh, there was water dripping out during the rain. So that means I identified the repair. I explained that since it was dry, I could not determine whether it was an active leak or if the repair was satisfactory. And the next day he proved it still leaked to everyone's satisfaction, but my report was accurate. My report was adequate, adequate. My report informed the client enough that he went up in the attic to follow up during the rain. And more importantly to me at this point was I'd covered myself every way possible. I'd followed the standards of practice, informed the client of the limitations of the inspection, 
and he followed up as he should said we've got a problem uh, so be sure that you understand your own limitations and communicate those now you see to the middle picture up here not only has there been repairs but there's been additional damage and it looks to me like uh, this was uh, abrasion by overhanging limbs and it was bad enough to do some repairs but apparently not bad enough to repair everything that was damaged or there were additional repairs or maybe they only had so many shingles to work with it's just kind of hard to say and on the right i think we see this all the time uh, that is where a satellite dish used to be um, there is flashing designed to go on the roof installed like any other a roof boot and it's up off the ground up off the roof deck so that you can mount your antenna to this it's, it's raised and it looks like um, a, a box off the ground so all the fasteners are under here and it is installed as flashing should be in shingle fashion and the antenna does not penetrate and compromise your roof but you see this an awful lot of the time one of the recommendations that I make to my client is do not remove the bracket, which is what they did here. If it doesn't leak, leave it alone. Uh, I do recommend that they remove the poles and the antenna itself, especially those that don't have the tripod mount and they're subject to, to wind damage, which is a lot of times uh, what causes the um, the fasteners to come loose and, and leak so if i see an antenna on the roof leave it alone down in the lower left they didn't actually replace any shingles they just coated it with some sort of uh, uh, roof sealant and uh, i think that's about the worst way you can do it because you can see from the size of that repair they didn't know where it was leaking so they just kept on applying sealant until it took care of it. You see it goes all the way up the valley flashing. That's probably the worst thing that could be done and that was probably done by the homeowner. Um, I did not have access to the homeowner to ask about it and the seller's disclosure did not note any problems uh, because as far as they were concerned, it didn't leak, uh, but we don't know which part of that roof is where the source of the water is you have a you can have an improperly installed valley and we'll talk about valleys in a little while you could have a little bit of leak by that boot because it doesn't look like that boot was installed shingle flashing uh, as shingle um, it looks like the apron of that boot is underneath um, the shingles Kind of hard to tell from here but that's what it looks like which means all of the additional mastic that they put here or or sealant um, may not have been necessary but we still don't know the source of that leak and it would be very difficult to get into these areas from the attic space so we have a leak here that we we have evidence of repair probably because of a leak and at this point, we have no way of knowing whether or not that was a, an adequate repair. We have more of these. Um, these up here may have been two antenna. Kind of hard to say. This looks like an antenna. This looks like an antenna. And this looks like just uh, a place where they sealed some of that flashing. I have found six satellite antennas on one house and that's because when they come out to install a new one if you switch carriers if you um, if you are going to have another dish installed for whatever reason the installer is not going to take liability for that last dish if it leaks they're not going to take the blame for it so they just put another one on so as many as six antenna on one roof is is what i have found so we're going to talk about uh, installation or proper installation. This is going to be limited because of our time, but we're going to just maybe hit some highlights of it. 
This is the definition of roof assembly from the IRC. It includes the roof decking, the vapor retard, tartar, substrate or thermal barrier, basically the underlayment, insulation because there is some insulation underneath some roof decking, and the roof covering materials. Now, uh, we're going to talk about roof covering materials, uh, but the definition just says roof covering. How the roof structure is built is critical. Um, each piece of that is important. The framing, if the framing doesn't support it, you're going to have failure of the framing, which can affect uh, roof cover, which affects leaks. The sheathing, we're going to kind of go into some detail there. The underlayment, if it's improperly installed, we'll talk about that. Likewise, fasteners and flashing. Now, much of this you can't really see. You can see the impact if it's been installed incorrectly, but unless there's a leak, you can't, well, even if there is a leak, you don't know what necessarily caused it, which one of these um, roof components uh, caused the failure. Now, that is based on the IRC, but we also have, based on the uh, TREC standards of practice, other components, flashing and drain systems. Uh, drain systems I personally put in uh, grading and drainage, and I include that because you have the gutters and you have improper termination of gutters, so I include that there. But if we have drain systems like gutters, whether it's integral or uh, in installed on the outside against the fascia, we see problems with those all the time. It can cause overflow. It can cause damage to the roof. It can cause... Um, many problems. And then flashing, of course, for penetrations is critical. And we so see so many times that the, the flashing is the, which is intended to keep water out, is the very source of the leak anyway. <clears throat> Space panels, one eighth inch. Now, this is um, <clears throat> the Engineered Wood Association that makes this recommendation. But if you'll notice down there, it says one eighth inch at ends and sides. <clears throat> I think you're not gonna see this unless you're doing um, framing inspections or inspections where you can see it before the installation of the roof cover, the underlayment the roof cover. If you try to look at that from the attic space, the butt joints should terminate over a, a rafter. And if it doesn't, you've got a bigger problem and you should be able to identify that uh, pretty quickly. But that eighth inch spacing at ends and sides is what allows for the expansion of the, of the decking without impacting the roof cover itself. Now, H clips, are what we generally see to create that spacing. But understand that H clips are not required unless the rafters are spaced more than 24 inches on center. So the use of H clips is more a convenience um, than anything else. I'll think, I, I think that a lot of the older builders will be able to tell you that they just dropped a uh, nail in there to create that that spacing. So today we use the H clips, but you'll also see in the illustration down on the lower right, up here especially, uh, you might see here in the illustration that there is the space, but in reality they're butted right up to each other and you have problems. Remember that this material will expand, and if it expands, you start to see performance problems like um, this at this point. We'll see how fancy I can get. So you're going to see all of these areas right here, and that's not related to anything more than the decking. Pretty consistent here. Real workmanship problems. And it was allowed by the builder. Their own quality control didn't catch it or didn't care about it. 
um, and everybody else. But we come out here and we see that. What can happen then is you get movement in, what did I spell there? Boo. Uh, this is my Halloween presentation. Um, we come out and we see that and we can see that over time, the movement of that can just wear out the shingle along that line. And then it looks to me like right here uh, might be some, some other areas where there, there's a problem. So even though you can't see this, you can see the impact of doing it wrong. Uh, is anybody going to fix that? Probably not. But I would definitely encourage you to document that the shingles aren't flat there and that it appears to be related to decking uh, more than it's related to the installation of the roof cover. But also note that that can create a, a problem with the roof, roof cover itself. And remember that it's, it's unlikely that the, it's unlikely that the manufacturer would warrant any damage caused by that improper installation. And we have this, I've seen this reported as a deficiency because of code violations. Remember that it is only a recommendation by the Engineered Wood Association, but some manufacturers either require it or recommend it. Now the real risk here is you have a short width of decking and the recommendation is that there are more H clips than uh, typically required. And the idea is to give more support there because this narrower piece is simply uh, weaker along this area. The time that you see this really causing damage is during the installation and the removal of, and replacement of a roof cover. Because it's so weak, uh, most of the times you see that they, the installers load the roof by just laying the shingles on top of that. So they put a lot of weight on this little narrow, broken, or weak board. And then when they re-roof, they use the shovel to remove all the shingles. And they just, it, you can see a re-roofed house with a, a narrow top um, deck board and it's just torn to pieces. Well, these additional H clips aren't necessarily going to stop the additional damage, especially if there is um, um, a very narrow four to six inches of uh, a deck board there. So, what about the underlayment? Well, this underlayment that you see there is very likely to um, cause those shingles to not lay flat. You can see all these places, it's, it's uneven. Uh, it's supposed to lay flat, but what we have very often is the, the roofer will just lay right over it. And then over here in the center, you see that we have um, there at the, the, the hip, uh, they just cut it. You don't have the, the um, overlap at the ridge or the hip the way you're supposed to, or sometimes at the, the hip. And especially uh, down here in the lower right, uh, what you see is instead of overlapping, they just took a utility knife and cut right down. So if there's a problem, I assume that they're going to, and in fact, I know for the fact that they did, um, when they laid the opposing underlayment, they cut it again and I'll show some pictures in a little while that shows with the loss of shingles there at the hip um, you can see what what caused it they, or not what caused the loss of shingle but what caused the leak after the loss of shingle you can lose the shingle and if your underlayment's installed correctly you really shouldn't well, you shouldn't necessarily have a problem. You may, if they installed the underlayment correctly, you're less likely to. 
Um, underlayment. There we go. The underlayment must be parallel to the roof. That underlayment can't go vertically because you have more opportunity here for the um, water to migrate under those laps. And they put an awful lot of fasteners here, but that's not a substitute for correct installation. And since you can't install it vertically, you really can't install it at an angle either. And this, in fact, looks like a worse condition because water can run down. And even though it should be lapped, right here isn't. So this is something you'll never be able to see. But you can see the impact and assume that there's some problem in the way it was uh, installed. Workmanship. Here you have where they sliced through the shingles at the hip and they sliced through the underlayment as well. And they sliced through the underlayment as well. And they sliced through the underlayment. Many times when you see this condition, uh, the installer's solution is to take that same util utility knife and slice it. And then that's their way of getting rid of the, the high spot but it is not an effective way of uh, installing the roof cover. All right. Um, Brenda, do you have any questions? Is anybody out there with questions? We do have some questions. Okay. All right, the first one is, I've been in attics that were cooled due to the use of aluminum foil on the back side of the plywood OSB sheathing. Does this type of sheathing cause any shingle issues? Does what kind of, uh, does what cause issue? Does this type of sheathing cause any shingle issue? I don't know, let's, Tech Shield is a brand, but LP has their own brand. Um, these are materials that are called radiant barriers and they're intended to pro provide um, a cooler attic. I don't know of any roof manufacturer that says you can't use that type of material. The bigger problem is when that is insulated, uh, when they put insulation up between there, whether it's spray foam or batting, and they don't allow airflow above it. It's the airflow that's more critical than whether or not you have the radiant barrier. Now, a lot of times we'll see a spray on silver paint. Um, sometimes that is used to encapsulate scorched wood in case of fire. And sometimes it's intended to be a radiant barrier. Uh, I would suggest that you don't um, state that it's one or the other until you've been very careful to see what it might be covering. If you use it, that silver paint to encapsulate scorched wood, uh, typically you're going to see fire damaged wood. Uh, but if it's just a silver paint intended to be quote unquote a radiant barrier, um, in my opinion, that's a waste of paint. It, it doesn't satisfy anything, but the tech shield itself, I don't know of any uh, shingle manufacturer that says that is a problem for their uh, shingle cover performance. What else? Have you ever seen someone use aluminum foil as, uh, on the back side? I have seen a foil uh, material used as a radiant barrier, but it is sold as a radiant barrier. So I'm assuming that you're not talking about Reynolds foil wrap from the kitchen. But yes, there are foil materials used. And if you read them, read the installation instructions, you can see that they can be used on the rafters. They can also be used down on the floor joists. Um, 
it's very difficult to install those in either case. But if it's installed on the, the, against the roofing, it needs to be against the uh, rafters so that you have the airflow between them. But the answer is yes, there are foil materials to be used as radiant barriers to be installed post construction. Biggest problem with those is they can't get down into those very low spots at the eaves. Um, but they're out there. What else? Okay. What sections of the trek form do you comment about the decking sagging? Just in roof covering, just in attic section, or both? Both. Um, my experience is that they don't read the report very carefully and they might read one section without reading the other and sometimes they won't read either section and then that gives them justification for saying well you didn't tell me or you didn't tell me in this section i think one of the most um the best example would be when you talk about, for, for perhaps in a, a furnace, you talk about the gas connections in the furnace, and then you have another section when you talk about gas and the plumbing. So when I'm doing the furnace and I see an issue related to gas piping, I will say, see plumbing. And then in plumbing, I'll discuss that. And the reason is they said, well, I had a plumber out here and if you had just said that the problem was um, a plumbing issue rather than put it in, putting it under a heating issue, we could have had it all uh, fixed at one time. That did not happen to me. That happened to somebody else. But that's what caused me to put things in two locations. So I see roof decking that has impacted the roof cover. I put that in roof cover. And then when I'm in the attic, I say, we have the decking issue that I discussed in roof cover. So you can either report it in both or make a statement that refers to the other. Um, personally, I go a step farther, further when I say that I've reported this in the other section. Um, you can make a hyperlink that you click on it and it automatically takes you to the other section. Um, doesn't take too much time to do that and I have to do it. I don't have to do it so often that it's a problem but that is an absolute guarantee that they know I've reported it in two places and they can't come back on me I've been diligent I've done a good job I've told the clients what to do and if they don't read the report it's on them not me what else okay and what roof pitch is considered to be too steep to walk on remember that picture where I pointed to the guy standing on the very top, that's gonna to be a call you have to make. Uh, a lot of it depends on what I have that I can hold on to when I'm going up there. But if you want a, a, a safe answer, it is anything uh, more than 412. Now that's not what I adhere to because you can walk up a valley easier than you can walk up the field of a roof. You can walk up a, a hip easier than you can walk up the field, field of the roof. You can walk by a dormer where you can hold on to the trim and then hold on to the eave of the dormer easier than you can walk up the field of the roof. If it's dry and the, shink, the roof cover is new, um, you can walk up the field easier than one that's old and the granules are all loose. But if you want a safe answer, 412. I don't think that's uh, necessarily realistic, but that's a safe answer. What else? Brenda? I'm sorry. Is there a specific temp that you define as too hot to walk on asphalt shingles? Anything over 110, that's the roof deck because you can get 110 and, and much higher with the 100 degree temperature outside. So um, if I put my hand on it and it scorches my hand, I'm concerned about the impact uh, of me walking on that roof. Um, 
and, and I, I would I would use the hand scorch as as because uh, it also increases a safety issue if that roof deck is so hot that you have to keep lifting your hands off you're going to have a problem uh, getting on and off that roof. Okay. Do you ever indicate that repairs made do not appear to have been performed by a professional roofer? Um, absolutely. But the terminology I use is that the repairs did not appear to be made in a workmanlike manner and therefore may not have been uh, done by a professional. The key to it is that you cannot tell whether it was an effective repair. However, if it's not done in a workmanlike manner, it is more likely to be ineffective. Remember that workmanlike is defined in the code. So you can use workmanlike without uh, necessarily creating a condition where, hey, in my opinion, that wasn't done very well. In my opinion, that was sloppy. In my opinion, you say it wasn't done in a workmanlike manner, and then you can follow that up with there is a definition of a workmanlike, and this isn't it. Okay. And we have the question What do you feel about radiant uh, barrier material used on the attic floor? On the attic floor. Let me uh, clarify on the attic floor. Yes. Well, that material, the foil material that I've described, which can be used on the attic floor, um, I have a personal problem with, and I actually, thank you, uh, I have a, a photograph of that that occurred within this last month that it didn't occur to me to put in this. The biggest problem I had with it was, since it covers everything, what's safe to walk on? Do I think it's effective? I have no idea. I honestly don't, because I've never seen anything other than from the, the manufacturer that talks about how great their product is, but I don't have any information that says before and after uh, it's effective. I've never seen and would not expect to see um, tech shield type materials applied uh, across the entirety of the, um, the attic space. So I think that means that what you're talking about is limited to that foil material. Can't tell you if it's effective, but I can tell you it's unsafe. Okay, last two questions. On the lifted shingles at the seams, could this also be caused by decking getting wet and swelling at the seams? Absolutely, but it could also be caused by the roof being, the roof cover, being installed on top of a wet uh, vapor barrier or, or underlayment. It can be caused by the roof cover not being installed um, quickly or timely. You're supposed to have a dry roof deck, then install a dry um, underlayment, and then install immediately the roof cover, assuming that the underlayment is still dry. If, if you do it wet, the wet underlayment on top of the roof deck, you're gonna have um, possible deterioration of the roof decking. Remember that the underlayment is not only to provide a secondary drainage path, that it is intended to protect the roof deck from the shingles and the roof shingles from the deck because of the, the way those materials can interact. So the underlayment has more than one purpose. If it's installed wet, you got a problem. You install the shingles wet, you've got a problem. If you don't install them quickly enough, then you have all the dirt and the debris that comes from a construction site or comes from uh, re-roofing and all of that gets in there and now you've added an, um, a, a abrasive material that can cause its own problem. Okay. What else? Last question that I have here. As soffit and fascia are above the plate line, do you consider this area roof structure in your report? 
Say that again, please. As soffit and fascia are above the plate line, do you consider this area roof structure in your report? In my report is, is the important part of, of that. In my report, I put it under wall cladding. And in my report, I, I have a statement that says that I am considering these materials under the exterior wall components. Um, I do that for several reasons, because the type of materials are consistent with the type of materials used in wall cladding. The type of materials are going to be repaired by the same type of, of, of workmen that will replace the wall materials. Um, and I have that statement whether or not I make any um, observation of deficiencies in those soffits or in those um, fascia or in the freeze or any of those components. So yes, I put it under wall cladding. Um, and I'm very comfortable with doing that. There, there's also, some of you might be a member of other associations and I'm gonna throw out ASHI, uh, throw out InterNACHI. They have standards of practice uh, in addition to the TAPRIA standards of practice and in addition to the TREX standard of practice. And at least one of those requires um, reporting of those things and it must be very clear where it's reported. So I do in my report consider it to be and report it under wall cladding. Okay, another question came in if you would like one more. Sure. Are roof membrane materials better than tar felt pa paper? The tar isn't used anymore. That is a, a, an older product. And that's why I'm very careful to refer to an underlayment. You can call it a roofing felt. I would caution you not to call it tar paper. So an underlayment can be a roofing felt and it can be a synthetic. Um, you'll find that most manufacturers of roofing covers are very specific about the material they want you to use as an underlayment. And now you'll see that those are generally um, synthetic materials. Now, let's take a step back and say, well, is that because of performance of a synthetic material or is it because that's a product they're selling? Well, I believe first and foremost, it's a product they're selling because GAF is not gonna recommend that you use a certainty synthetic product. But in my opinion, the synthetic product is a better underlayment. It has a better performance there are fewer um, laps, there are fewer penetrations, there is less um, wear, and I think it is a longer term performing product, but I would also have to caution you that that synthetic product has not been around 30 years, and therefore I don't know that we have a history of performance that would guarantee my opinion right now. But I do believe the synthetic product is better, but I would not re report it as a problem uh, at all. I wouldn't, in, in fact, I don't even address the fact to the client, if I can determine it's uh, synthetic, that it's there. Um, but that's my opinion. What else? Okay, that's it. You've answered all those questions. I love the questions. That's uh, that's tells me more than anything about whether we're uh, on track with our uh, presentation or not. So please keep those coming in. What affects the performance of a roof cover? You now it's the type of cover itself. Um, since we're just talking about um, asphalt here, I'll, I'll note that you have an asphalt roof that's a simple three tab roof. 
you have an asphalt roof that is laminated. So you take what appears to be a three tab and you start laying pieces on it. And by the time it's all said and done, it emulates a, um, a shake roof or a shingle roof, the way they used to do it with their lapping. It, the architectural shingle then is thicker and so it has a longer life. The three tab shingle uh, is generally considered to have a 15 to 20 year life. And you'll look on the package of the three tab shingle and the manufacturer might say it's 15 years and they might say it's 20 years. And in my explanation of the type of cover to the client, I will say that it might be sold as 15 or 20 and the average life expectancy is generally between 15 and 20, but closer to the 15 year, assuming no acts of God, including hurricanes, tornadoes, um, tree limbs, and satellite antennas. And then there's always the case of, of the homeowner that gets up there and does something stupid. Um, when I was 10 years old, I found out that, uh, of course, World War II was not so far in the past. And I learned that landing uh, on a parachute was with a parachute was about the equivalent of jump, jumping off a one story roof. Uh, so I did that a number of times just to, to see if that might be true. I, I guarantee you, I did some damage up on that roof. Um, so the homeowner can cause problems. And then you have the architectural shingle, the laminated shingle that is generally sold with a life expectancy of 25 to 30 years. And I make the same sort of explanation that assuming no acts of God or um, somebody climbing up on that, uh, you're gonna have a life expectancy generally between 25 and 30 years. Now, yes, I know that there are some shingles that are sold as uh, 40 year, and you have some that say lifetime, but if you look at the warranty very carefully, you'll see that uh, it, it's not warranty for a lifetime because there are limitations. Um, quality of materials. You always have a better quality shingle priced higher that is available. So you would not expect a low quality, whether it's three tab or laminated to last as long as a higher quality shingle. You can't know that, you can't anticipate that. Yes, there are uh, scales, there are tools designed that you would slip the shingle into it and based on where it comes, it's gonna tell you how thick it is and therefore how long uh, a life it's generally considered to have. Um, I'm not lifting shingles to be able to, to slide that in there. Roof design. Um, I have uh, an illustration a little later that shows all the various pitches. At one time, you might have had a simple gable roof. It's just two slopes, and then you have the gambrel roof, and then you have the mansard roofs, and you have all of these other designs and the shingles lay differently. And when they uh, lay differently, they, um, they react differently to weather. And you might have steep roofs that have that wind hit it. You might have shallow roofs where the wind goes over it very easily, but then the rain is going to hit it harder. Um, and all of those designs um, change the demands and the need for flashing. And again, I told you a while ago that flashing is one of the places that is most, uh, most often the source of the water intrusion. It's intended to keep the water out, but if it's improperly installed, that becomes the source of intrusion. Weather, we have the wind, rain, and hail. Uh, wind is going to throw things into the roof cover. Wind is going to take the granules, the aggregate off the roof cover. And wind will severely impact ridges and hips because that's where it changes directions as it goes across the, um, uh, that 
portion of the roof cover. Um, rain. A low slope roof is going to have that rain hit at a straight down or closer to straight and the impact of it is going to be more than if it is at an angle. Um, hail. We'll talk about hail towards the end of this, but obviously hail is going to be uh, damaging to a roof. Sunlight, UV rays. Well, that shingle is intended to protect everything else and is intended to be designed to handle all the UV rays that might be there. Um, but if you look at some roofs where you have some part of it that has tree covering and some part of it doesn't, you see algae growth under the, um, the areas that have no UV rays. So even though the UV rays might cause damage, if the, prop the shingles properly designed, designed, um, manufactured, those root UV rays should not be a real problem. Temperature. Insulation and ventilation. We talked about the insulation against the roof deck, and that would include uh, insulated boards. It would include insulation boards placed between rafters, and it would include the spray foam. And as far as I'm concerned, it would include the radiant barrier, whether it is the radiant barrier deck or the radiant barrier installed post construction. If that is installed improperly, that roof cover may overheat. Likewise, ventilation. If you have not enough ventilation, or if you have improperly designed ventilation, or if you have poor performing ventilation, that temperature is going to rise, it's going to affect the roof cover, and it will shorten its life. Color. The color of the roof is going to uh, impact how the sunlight reflects because darker colors absorb heat, lighter colors reflect heat. The majority of the colors that we see are a little darker than tan, they're brown, but you always uh, can't expect that there's some owner, owner out there that decides that he would really like a black roof. Um, that's going to absorb the heat. It's going to affect the roof. Now, I would hope that if a manufacturer is going to design a dark roof, he is going to design that dark roof so that it will handle all the heat that might be absorbed. And we have the homeowner whether it's me climbing on a roof to jump off because, hey, that sounds like fun, or if um, I'm going to go up there and install my own antenna. Uh, see ham operators that will get up there and they'll do some crazy things to get that antenna to stand upright as high as they need it to. Um, many times there's not a chimney and they'll just start hammering things in and putting guy wires and screwing eye bolts in and it becomes a real problem. Uh, or the homeowner that decides that they're qualified to go up there and install a solar powered uh, exhaust vent. Uh, can't be that hard, right? So that homeowner can cause as many problems as any of those other things with regard to failure. Minimum slope of roof covering. Well, you can, you can, um, we'll, we'll get to the, the slope for walking in a second, but you see I eliminated the bottom three bullets because we're only talking about asphalt shingles. And it says that asphalt shingles should be installed on roof slopes two and 12 or greater. Four and 12 is the manufacturer's recommendation for the minimum slope for most asphalt shingles unless special techniques are used for installation of the uh, underlayment. And the underlayment would have to be installed um, essentially with much greater overlap. 
So here's your chart of acceptable pitches for the various uh, types of cover. So green is pretty straightforward asphalt shingles installed according to the manufacturer's installation instructions with no special techniques. Uh, the special techniques down here on the 112 to 16 would include that underlayment overlap that we talked about. Uh, when you get down into this lower slope, um, that's the roll roofing. But how often do you see what might be a very steep pitch that has two valleys come together and you might have down in that valley in Eve a very small area that might be three foot wide coming to a, a point where it's funneling all that water down the steep pitches into a valley that comes down there and it ends at the bottom with that almost flat or um, one less than 112 pitch. That area hopefully is protected better by the underlayment than any other area and hopefully the installation and the design and creation of that valley is going to be better than any other area but many times I see an almost flat roof down there at the eave to accommodate the multiple pitches. Uh, you got to be very careful in those areas but if um, you're up here in 4 and 12, you're pretty much good on anything. Down in 1 and 12, including those shed roofs that get installed over a, uh, a patio, if it's attached, and sometimes the homeowner will just go straight down onto that. Uh, I've seen it done without any flashing. So you go from a, a steep pitch or a normal pitch down to a, a low pitch, with no flashing, that transition is why you end up with roof, le roof leaks um, on those patio covers. Okay, real quick before we transition to a discussion of the deficiencies themselves, any more questions? Okay, report is deficient. Well, we have problems with nail length. We have problems with the number of nails, the position of the nails, underdriven, overdriven nails, and withdrawing of nails. Now the fasteners apply to all roof covering types, but the majority of them um, are going to apply only to, well, I guess that's wrong. It's gonna to apply to all, but we're just talking about the uh, asphalt. We can't see those. Now, when I do windstorm inspections, I actually have to go in and lift up the shingles to count the nails. But if I'm doing a truck inspection, there is no way I'm going to pry up any tab because it might tear, it would be loose from then on, I'd hold all liability for it. And I would have to, I'd have to cut or uh, lift up so much shingle to actually have a um, effective evaluation of the number of faster that I'll just tell you it's not going to happen. Okay over here I, again I must have been drinking on the left hand side but what you see in the upper right is the shank the there's just a lack of fasteners there but you'll look closely you'll also see along that red line which is at the end of the the um, wood structural panel, there's not an eighth inch gap. Over here on the left, um, you can see two nails close together, but down here, you see they're much further apart. It entirely depends on the area that you're decking. Here, obviously a problem. It looks like uh, in this particular case, they did not leave that one eighth inch gap, and they didn't even bother to to hammer it down flush. When you're looking at the shingles themselves, uh, what you're seeing here is a pattern for a high wind area and a pattern for normal. The normal has four and the high wind area has six. Now keep this in mind, and I don't want to turn this into a discussion of, of wind uh, storm, but four nails 
will meet the requirement for wind load areas, but it may not meet the manufacturer's requirements for purposes of warranty. But again, those, those nails are gonna be covered. You're not gonna know that unless there's other problems. That's a three tab shingle down here. You have the same issue with a um, architectural or a laminated shingle. But here's why nailing is so important. If you nail the shingles where you're supposed to nail the shingles, then you have nails along two rows. You have it down here where it transitions from um, the style of you have the flat part down to the exposed part. So this is concealed, this is exposed, and you have that faster, and here you have the adhesive strip. Then that next one, if it's nailed properly, is going to be on the top part of that. So every shingle tab should have two rows of, shing of nails, assuming that they're installed properly. So you can see down here, that one covers this. So there's your two rows, but up here, it was too high and it missed it. So this one only has one row of nails. You're gonna see those when there are problems. Well, here, they didn't put it where it's supposed to, so it was uh, between the tabs. And then here, uh, that looks like, Frankly, that looks like to me, somebody came back and says, well, I've got an extra nail. I'm going to put it right here after the shingles are done. And then here you have the same thing exposed. So none of these were put where they were supposed to be. And then you have the problem with whether they actually installed the nail correctly itself. A lot of times you can see the impact of this, uh, mostly with an underdriven nail. You're not going to see overdriven unless the shingle is ripped out during wind because it's lost uh, its uh, adhesive. Crooked you might see, but this is what you're gonna see more often than not, and you're gonna see it in something like this. Now, this doesn't really look like they underdrove the nail. This looks like the nail worked its way back out. So you have the decking that flexes and moves with humidity and heat and that nail over time um, uh, will work its way back up and it will lift that shingle or down here it will work its way through the shingle here it lifted the shingle and this is at the end cap of a ridge and they just didn't caulk those they didn't seal those i said caulk but they seal it which can be a roof grade caulk all of these you can see and all of these I would report as deficient uh, because remember that one nail hole I showed you uh, before, that one nail hole over 13 years caused some pretty major damage. But let's say that you have some problems with that, it's easy solution, you just nail it from the attic space, just come right on up there. That'll certainly hold it in place. Um, what I see frequently is when there's a measurement problem and the deck uh, joint does not line up over a rafter, they nail a board alongside it. In this case, I have no clue why they did, did this, but instead of nailing into the rafter, they nailed into the roof deck. That's a big oops. Fasteners alone don't keep the, um, the the shingles down. A starter course. Now you should have a starter course and you can either take a shingle, the manufacturer allows you to take a shingle and cut it and turn it over and use it as a starter course. And then that adhesive strip is what catches the overlying uh, shingle cover. But the biggest problem I see is that the fasteners for that are so far from the edge of the uh, shingle at the eave that there's nothing holding it up. So the overlaying shingle may, <coughs> excuse me, I consider this wrong, the overlaying shingle may be adhered right here, but wind can still get under there and lift the whole thing up. So those nails, according to the manufacturer, need to be much closer down here, but there is no mark along the shingle for where to nail it like there is, or no mark along a cut shingle. You can buy a, a starter strip like this one 
where it tells you where to nail. Uh, and this is not a cut, this is sold as a starter strip. And I see uh, down here, sometimes a homeowner will try to do something. They spend all their time, time trying to remove this, uh, this strip. The only purpose of that is to keep the shingles from sticking together while they're in the bundle. And if it's not done right, if you don't have adhesion, you're gonna have problems. Those shingles are just gonna lift up. And this is a case where the underwriter came in and following windstorm said, we got all these problems. And if you look, you'll see that right here, it was creased, it was creased, it was creased. And all of these were lifted up. That's just because the front didn't adhere. So what happens? Well, you can have a real problem there. It just will allow those shingles to lift and that will mean that you're gonna lose some shingles or it might mean that you lose a lot of shingles. So what do you do if you have a problem with that? Well, the manufacturer says that you can just uh, use some adhesive uh, to hand seal those. And in fact, you'll have some manufacturers that says hand sealing is required in certain cold air, cold weather, or on steep slopes, mansard roofs. If you do a repair, for example, you replace a roof jack or some sort of a bonnet, that's when you need to hand seal. Skylights, uh, just any of those places, hand sealing might be required. I never see it. And down here in cold weather is the one that really is, is gonna have more impact than anything else. I do report it if it's um, loose. So what can cause damage? We talked about some of that, but here's another case of that installer laid the shingle on top of it and cut it. Did that go through enough to damage the shingle from a, a, a is it gonna leak? I don't think that's gonna leak, but it is poor workmanship. And certainly in new construction, and I see it a lot of times in new construction, I bring it to the attention of the client who should bring it to the attention of the home builder. And I tell them that that needs to be replaced for the manufacturer. And if they don't want to replace it, give my client a letter that says they've seen it and will warranty it. And I guarantee you that they're not going to do any of those things. They might replace it if the homeowner is aggressive enough. Okay. Give you one shot to guess what that is. Um, I have found now, I believe, seven bullets. And uh, it's always interesting to see one. And you talk about people getting killed and hurt when their shots are fired. They gotta land someplace. And at least seven times I've found where they've landed on a roof. Now that's kind of a small area, but um, this leads me to this comment. Um, you write your report and you say, that there's a hole in the roof, there's a nail exposed, there's this, there's that. And then they expect a, um, a builder, not a builder, a roofer to come out and find that. Well, I got into a conversation with the roofer and, and he was really laying into me for that. This was during a windstorm inspection. I said, okay, what's your solution? He said, chalk. I now carry chalk in, in one of the chapter meetings here. I gave out uh, a lot of chalk holders and chalk or chalk because I got it for free. Um, and I carry it with me and I'll go up on the roof and I see spots like this. I'll mark it with chalk and take a picture of it. The advantage is now somebody can see clearly in the picture where it is, but they're also able uh, to have somebody come out and fix that. Chalk, if the homeowner gets mad, wash it off. Chalk just goes away with water. Granule loss. This looks like a manufacturing defect. You can see that there's a very distinct pattern uh, and that is a separate issue, but that to me is not abrasion or wind or anything else. The, the installer never should have allowed that to stand. <clears throat> the builder should never have allowed that to stand. Now, what makes me think this is a manufacturing uh, problem? You look over here on the right-hand side, you see that pattern? 
that tells me that this um, is maybe a, a specific lot of shingles or bundle of shingle. And by lot, I mean a production lot. Uh, something is going on there that's unique to this area. So I think that's manufacturing. Well, this can be wind, it can be age, it could be heat, or it could be manufacturing. It doesn't really matter to me. I'm reporting a defective shingle. Effects of age. This can also be heat here, but you're just getting the granule loss. That's a worn out roof. And I, most often I end up describing that as at the end near the end or at the end of its useful life. And without regard to its performance, I don't care if it's leaking or not, the condition of that roof is such that it's gonna probably have to be replaced. And keep in mind that a roof in that condition, uh, the home buyer probably cannot get insurance on it. So be sure you address that. And then down here, the, the purpose of this slide or photo is to show you how much granule uh, accumulation there is here. Those roofs are just almost bare of, of the granules and here's close-ups over to the side. You can see how full that is. That's a worn out roof. What about blistering? Well, you have some of the materials that are in the um, the shingle itself, some of what makes that shingle and those can um, get hot and then they almost explode and they blister. Uh, that shingle is one that should be replaced. If I see a condition like that, report it. I'm watching my time, Brenda. Do we have questions? I have two questions here that uh, one is, you say fasten from inside out. Would you elaborate, please? I'm sorry, that was a joke. I hope nobody took that seriously. What was the question? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm sorry, it says you say fasten from inside out. Elaborate, please. Okay, from now on, when I'm sarcastic, I'm, I'm going to do something like this. That was sarcasm. All right. Uh, the next question is, do you attempt to estimate roof age? Uh, absolutely not. I do attempt to, if possible, tell them the age of the roof. Now, I might say that the seller said, the buyer said, the disclosure said, uh, Texas Department of Insurance has a certificate that says, a permit says, but if I don't have anything like that that I can blame on somebody else, no, I don't. But I never say it's gonna last X number of years. If I think that the roof is not gonna last X number of years and will affect their ability to get insurance or a loan, I, I'm to the point by then I have enough documentation to say this roof is at or near the end of its useful life and you need to make sure that it's insurable and pretty much that shuts it down. What else? Is that it, both of them? I have a couple of uh, additional questions. One is, is it step flashing supposed to be used where asphalt shingles meet vertical walls? More often, we see J flashing. It's just, it'll be here. I'm, I'm, we'll go, I'm going to go a little faster because I want to get, I don't want to take your time. Number of layers. You're not required to report it, but if you can tell there are multiple layers, I would absolutely uh, absolutely report it because some insurers will not report or insure roofs that have multiple layers. Um, some will do two layers, none will do three. Uh, you can't uh, roof over a, you can't have more than three, la two layers. So you can't put a third layer. You can't put a roof over wood shake or something like that because of this those nails don't have anything to go into now this is a case where the wood shake roof was covered with um, asphalt shingle they got rid of wood shake in the early early 80s late 70s 
So it's very unlikely you're going to see much of this anymore unless somebody is talking about an overlay. But I do still see it. Um, hail. You need to be very careful that you don't say this is hail damage. You see damage that is consistent with hail. And they need to have the underwriter look at it. Now, if I see this kind of damage, I tell them to have the seller's insurer look at it for a claim first. And I have been very fortunate that I've seen some of these or my client has gotten brand new roofs simply because the seller was made to have their insurer look at it. You can see things that might look like hail, and that's why I say it is consistent with, but not guaranteed. Let's see. And then be careful that you don't say it's hail because sometimes people fake it. Hail comes in a direction. So if you saw damage over here, then it's likely somebody faked it. Remember that there's different kind of impacts and this is not true hail damage. Too uniform. Sometimes you can see it in arches, arcs. So you're not required to report what the damage uh, was caused by. Just report what you can see. Okay, now we're into flashing. Roof and wall intersections. We'll just say, here's a picture. I'm cognizant of our time. Here's our picture. You have all this. And flashing sometimes is not installed very well. Sometimes the nails withdraw, that's workmanship. Flashing's not installed and anchored. You have damaged roof boots and we have the step flashing. All right, damage to the step flashing. The code was changed to allow what is called continuous flashing, which may also be called hemmed flashing because the 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 J is laid flat and it looks like a, a hem and then it can be called J flashing. Well, the problem is that this shingle is not flat and the manufacturer says my shingle needs to be laid flat. So even though the code says continuous flashing, J flashing, I'm sorry, yeah, J flashing or hem flashing is okay. The manufacturer says, I don't want you to install it that way. And if you install it that way, and if there's a problem, it's not going to be warranty. So I think that's your answer. J flashing is acceptable by code. It is not acceptable by the manufacturer. But the reality is nobody's going to come in there and fix it. So I explain it to my client. And I also explain that um, this is information because they shouldn't expect somebody to come out and fix that. Kick out flashing. Man, if you don't have kick out flashing where it's supposed to go, you're going to have a problem. But I see a lot of people call for kick out flashing where it's really not necessary. Okay, we're right at 1140. Brenda, do you want to talk while I'm just kind of clicking through? This, this place needed J flashing. Go ahead. All right. Just, uh, as a reminder, 